ProWrestlingTees.com slash 616 Entertainment is now live if you'd like to grab your own official 616 t-shirt. Or if you'd like to support the channel on Patreon, you can do so like the beautiful producers you see before you. None of this happens without your support, and I love you so much. Now let's get to it. When Resident Evil hit the Sony PlayStation in March of 1996, it revolutionized the video game landscape. The dawn of survival horror had arrived, and much like the hordes of undead enemies they battled in the game, players swarmed their favorite electronic stores to satiate their appetite. For entertainment, not, not human flesh. The game more than exceeded Capcom's sales predictions, which encouraged the company to get to work on a sequel right away. January 21st, 1998 saw the release of Resident Evil 2, a brand new nightmare overflowing with more enemies, scarier bosses, and a two-part story starring the fresh faces of Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield. But RE2 didn't come from the talented men and women at Capcom sitting in the studio pressing the sequel button over and over. Producing this game was a laborious, downright grueling journey, and today, we're gonna talk all about it. Welcome to the History of Resident Evil Part 2. Two, Undead Evolution. As you may have guessed from the thumbnail, this video will indeed cover the troubled development cycles of both Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. And I know your mouths are watering like you're a zombie on the streets of Raccoon City, so let's not waste any time and jump right into it. Right off the bat, I feel like it's worth noting that Resident Evil Director's Cut, the slightly remixed version of the original game that released in late 1997, only exists because of the troubles that plagued the development of RE2. The tale of Resident Evil 2 being a complete mess behind the scenes isn't a secret. To say the structure of the development team faced some changes would be a fairly generous statement. Takuro Fujiwara, the creator of Sweet Home, the game that planted the seeds that Resident Evil sprouted from, had left Capcom right after the release of RE1. He departed the company in order to create games he felt he wouldn't be given a chance to under Capcom's tutelage. Shout out to Tomba. Shinji Mikami, Resident Evil's director, stepped out of the driver's seat and into a producer role, handing the keys to the kingdom over to the now in way over his head Hideki Kamiya. We don't have to cover every single aspect of Resident Evil 2's development in excruciating detail and focus on the day-to-day -day operations with a magnifying glass the size of a tennis racket, but it is worth noting that right around the same time the game was 70% complete, it was cancelled at the hands of Shinji Mikami, who found the game to be nowhere near the quality it should when compared to the original. But unlike the first-person shooter days of Resident Evil 1, which there's next to zero evidence of outside of this singular piece of concept art, Resident Evil 2's original framework still exists. What you're looking at is footage from the cancelled version of Resident Evil 2, now commonly referred to by Hideki Kamiya and the RE community as Resident Evil 1.5. The game starred Leon Kennedy and Elza Walker, the motorcycle enthusiast student attending Raccoon University. The game actually did have some cool features to it not found in the final version of RE2, such as bloody, damaged clothing to indicate the player's state of health, and equipable body armor to prevent such a thing from occurring again. Enemy types pulled from the final build range from undead gorillas to human spider things that came straight out of my good friend Jerry's worst nightmares. These sound like cool ideas, sure. The issue is that these cool ideas did not coalesce into a big picture worthy of carrying the mantle of Resident Evil into the future. And if you're thinking, I don't know, it looks pretty cool to me. Here's a direct quote from Hideki Kamiya regarding Resident Evil 1.5's state before cancellation. It truly was a piece of shit. It was boring, devoid of vision, and a poor excuse for a horror game. It was decided by both Shinji Mikami and Hideki Kamiya that a man by the name of Noburo Shugimura would be brought in to rewrite the story from the ground up. Shugimura had previously worked on the television series Metal Hero Henshin, as well as Super Sentai, the basis for the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers here in the US. After playing through the original 1.5 build, Shugimura's main gripes were that the game had almost zero connection to the original, and lacked any semblance of thematic coherence. This is where Elza Walker was buried, Claire Redfield was born, and Resident Evil 2 became what we know it as today. That's a hell of an introduction, man, and it should also be noted that Shinji Mikami originally wanted to end Resident Evil 2 with hard finality, wrapping up the series for good. Obviously that idea was met with great resistance, luckily, for those of us who love the series, 
But let's talk about the Resident Evil 2 that we all know and love, shall we? My first experience with the game didn't come from little seven-year-old me going to the store and seeing it on the shelf and saying, hey, that's what I want for Christmas. I had no idea Resident Evil 2 even existed. My friend Tim and I had gone over to another kid's house, a house that unbeknownst to us contained a PlayStation demo disc. For those of you who are too young to remember demo discs, these were often packed in with video game magazines and usually contained a tiny sliver of several different upcoming titles, either in playable form or through video previews. Official PlayStation Magazine demo disc number 5 featured 9 games, chief amongst them, for us, was Resident Evil 2. I can still hear Tim saying, Resident Evil 2? Like it was yesterday. We eagerly tapped the X button and let the trailer roll. Resident Evil 2. <laughs> And then halfway through, we turned it off. We were scared shitless. The hopeless labored screams of the zombies were bone chilling. The breaking glass, the squawking of the crows, the fully automatic gunfire, the music, it was all just too, too much. How could it be that the game that we considered to be one of the scariest things we'd ever seen had been topped? Eventually, we got our acts together and watched the preview again. And then again, and again, and again. The image of the gigantic alligator in the sewer devouring our character whole left us feeling like there were no limits to the terror we would eventually endure. RE2 takes place just a few short months after the laboratory incident in the forest of the Arclay Mountains just outside of Raccoon City. Surprisingly, the virus was totally contained, and no one seems to notice anything ever happened. The grass is green, the sky is blue, I'm just kidding, it's fucking hell on earth. Word may not have spread around the country yet, but the goddamn T-Virus has certainly done its fair share of getting around town. The streets are littered with overturned cars, windows are shattered, fires erupt from every corner you peek around. In the blink of an eye, Raccoon City has fallen into a state of complete disrepair. And unfortunately for our two main protagonists, they have no idea what they're in for. Leon S. Kennedy is a cop who has zero days experience on the force, and Claire Redfield is a college student heading into town simply looking for her brother, Chris, who hasn't been in contact in months. What's interesting is that rather than letting us choose our protagonist of choice and play through the entire game, a la the original Resident Evil, RE2 grants us much more variety in the shape of A and B scenarios. It's not just, here's the game as Leon, here's the same game as Claire. For instance, choosing to play as Leon first will have Claire dealing with different enemies and missing items in the second scenario, and vice versa. The layouts and stories change depending on who is experiencing which chapter, which is a fun little wrinkle. Claire and Leon meet for the first time in a sea of headshots. Wait, don't shoot! Get down! <gasps> out of control semi-trucks. and roaring flames before agreeing to split up in an attempt to stay alive, as well as find a way the hell out of the city. The gameplay is largely the same as the original. Our characters are still heavy as hell, the cameras remain in fixed positions, we can't walk and shoot at the same time, you get the picture. <laughs> If you played the first game in the series, you don't need to know shit about the sequel. You're gonna do just fine. Where we do see an obvious change, though, is in the overall setting. RE1 was tight. It was claustrophobic. You never felt like you had any room to breathe. Resident Evil 2 begins out in the streets, in the open air. The Raccoon Police Department, where the majority of the game takes place, isn't nearly as confined as the seemingly ever-shrinking hallways of the mansion. That might sound less scary. It might sound like with more space, avoiding enemies would be easier, right? Wrong. The extra square footage on RE2's floor plan means that more enemies can be on screen at the same time. And these enemies, man, they're nasty. Returning for the sequel are the zombies, obviously, as well as the dogs, crows, and spiders. But that's not all we've got to worry about. Hell no. Were you afraid of the hunters from Resident Evil 1? Good. 
Here are their slippery, skinless, moaning, long-tongued, sharp-clawed cousins, the liquor. The first time you see one of these bastards zip across a window in the hallway you're about to enter, your balls retract into your body and the words, fuck that, escape from your lungs before you can even begin to fathom what you've just seen. Ladies, same deal. If you're playing RE2, you've got balls. Balls are a way of life when it comes to these things, and I hope yours are big, because later in the game, the liquors are bigger faster and stronger as they've had time to mutate while locked away from society. On top of the liquors, we've got the ivy and poison ivy to deal with as well. Remember Plant 42 from the first game? Well, that was just one experiment. Now the fuckers are walking around the hallways looking for people to spew acid onto. And don't worry, if bugs are your thing, we've got giant moths flying around as well as comically large cockroaches skittering about down in the sewers. But these are all D, C, and B tier hazards. When it comes to the A level, we're talking about the big boys. Remember the tyrant from RE1? The fucked up, organs outside his body, ugly son of a bitch inside but looked like one of those tubes you used to see at the bank? We blew him to high hell at the end of the first game, but he was one of many. Umbrella internally referred to that beast as T-002, and unfortunately for us, T-103 has just been released in Raccoon City. The difference in this tyrant's model number makes it clear that Umbrella considers this big bastard to be a more complete, more dangerous, more deadly evolution of the tyrant bioweapon. He will break through walls when you least expect it, his punches can whittle your health down into the danger zone in no time, and he soaks up bullets without flinching to the point that avoiding him is more often than not the best strategy you can choose. As we dig deeper into the story of Resident Evil 2, it becomes clear that there is a lot going on here. Leon runs into this hot Asian lady named Ada. Claire runs into this little white girl named Sherry. There's a brand new virus on the scene. Things are breaking down big time. Let's peel the layers of this onion. The canonical way to play through the scenarios is Claire A and Leon B, for the most part. It's pretty ambiguous what did and didn't happen when you put it under a microscope, but let's not go that deep into the weeds. Here's what you need to know. Claire Redfield's Where the Fuck Is My Brother mission answers a ton of questions about how nobody outside of this little town seems to realize any of these crazy things are happening. She finds Chris's journal, which reveals not only where he's gone, he flew to Europe to investigate Umbrella's main headquarters, which we'll talk about later, but that Umbrella has also modified the T-Virus into something much, much worse. The G-Virus, as it's called, is... Ugh, it's bad news. There are reports of various monsters not only in the forest, but now on the city streets. So why hasn't anyone done anything about it? Well, Chris attempted to. He brought these concerns, the G-Virus and the monsters, to the attention of the police chief, Brian Irons, who completely shut it down. It doesn't take long to figure out that half the town's paychecks are signed by Umbrella, and that's why no one wants to come forward. In what is without question some miraculous timing, a fax comes through for Chris, who has apparently had an investigation running on Chief Irons at a federal level. While the feds cannot prove that the G-Virus actually exists, they do spill the tea on Mr. Irons, who has been collecting money from Umbrella for over five years. No wonder nobody knows about the outbreak. No wonder there are no press conferences, no wonder he doesn't want to listen to Chris. He's getting paid ass loads of hush money on an annual basis from the company creating the fucking issue. Oh, and he's also been arrested for rape, not once, but twice. Sounds like he's great at his job, right? Our first encounter with the chief himself is lovely, as he's got the corpse of the mayor's daughter sprawled out on his desk, and he speaks as if nothing's wrong. Terribly sorry. <laughs> I thought you were another one of those zombies. Finding his private notes clues us into the fact that he knows the shit has completely hit the fan, and in his endless insanity, he feels betrayed. He's decided to block off every exit in the city and personally hunt down and kill everyone left in his precinct as his one final act. Irons is eventually killed after being face-fucked by an off-screen monster's tentacle, and as luck would have it, he gets split in two, like a coconut, right before our very eyes. If I have to go, I'm going to take you with me. Ugh. I just can't take the pain. Ah. 
While all of this is going on, Claire's also escorting a little girl around the precinct. Her name is Sherry, and she's constantly getting into trouble. We actually have to take control of Sherry multiple times and guide her through dangerous scenarios in order to find her way to safety. If you felt scared playing as a grown woman armed to the ass with heavy firearms, imagine playing as a child who doesn't know her elbow from a hole in the wall. Now, who is this little girl and why is she so important to the story? Well, this is a whole thing in and of itself. Let's try and rapid fire through this deal as fast as possible. The little girl's name is Sherry Bergen, daughter of bigwig umbrella researcher William Bergen, as seen here from the original game next to Wesker, and as seen here in Resident Evil 2. Jesus Christ, what happened? All right, well, William Birkin created the G-Virus after Wesker went into business for himself and fucked Umbrella over. William also went into business for himself after Umbrella didn't give him a promotion, and that's why the boys in black showed up to take the G-Virus by force. After being pumped full of lead, he injected himself with the virus, knowing full well it would turn him into a killing machine. His goal? Don't let the boys in black get away with stealing his life's work. That's where Sherry comes into play. You see, the difference between the T-Virus and the G-Virus is that those infected with the G-Virus can implant embryos into the body of another. Thus the face fucking we witnessed on Chief Irons. Sherry and William's biological link will allow the embryo to survive inside her and produce G-Virus offspring. An implanted embryo in the body of someone you don't share a biological link with will end up in violent rejection, thus the coconut splitting we witnessed on Chief Irons. So, yes, the monster formerly known as William Birkin is roaming the halls of the police station looking for his daughter who he plans to impregnate with an embryo of a virus he created to ensure its long-term survival. What. The. Fuck. I know this is a lot to take in, but that's the journey, man. Resident Evil 2 is messed up on so, so many levels, but it doesn't stop there. William implants the embryo in Sherry before we can make it to her rescue, which is fucking gross, but now the race is on to try and save her life. That's when Burke and boss fight number one occurs. Also, I hope you're keeping up, because at this point we've gone from the RPD to the sewers, and now we've made it to, you guessed it, another underground laboratory. The aforementioned advanced liquors prowl these cold steel halls, as do the walking, spitting ivy sons of bitches. In our search for answers on how to save Sherry, Annette Birkin, William's wife and Sherry's mother, shows up, gun in hand, cutting a promo about how William was a genius, and that no one can steal his creation. She has no idea what he did to their daughter, but hey, great timing, he's here! And my oh my has he grown. They talk it out, like adults, I'm kidding, he kills the shit out of her. Finally seeing the error of her and her husband's ways, she hands over the formula to create the G-Virus antidote, which we can use to save Sherry. The antidote is created and it's time to save this girl's life, right? Wrong. William is back. He's bigger, nastier, and meaner than ever. Halfway through the boss fight, he takes a breather, mutates further, and now he's jumping around the factory like a fucking 900 pound flea covered in 6 foot bone needles. William is defeated, Leon and Claire reunite, save Sherry with the antidote, and escape to safety. So wait, hold on. Leon and Claire reunite. Where the hell has Leon been this whole time? Well, I'm glad you asked. This won't take as long to cover because a lot of what Claire does as far as tracking down keys and unlocking doors, Leon's gonna have to do it too. Is that nonsensical? Yeah! But are we gonna lose sleep over it? No! You will notice that I touched on all the big moments of Claire's entire scenario and didn't bring up the advanced model tyrant that I mentioned earlier. That's because he's a B scenario exclusive. Fuck this guy. Try your best to avoid him. He's an extremely deadly pain in the ass. Before long, Leon meets Ada Wong, a sexy Asian lady who says she's looking for her boyfriend, John. We control Ada in parts of Leon's story the same way we controlled Sherry in portions of Claire's story. Ada isn't as keen on working together as Leon is, but she goes along for the ride. Their disproportionate care for each other is constantly evident. Several times across the story, Ada disappears and does her own thing. When Annette opens fire and Leon takes a bullet for Ada, she's like, thanks dude, and pieces out to chase Annette down rather than get him help. Ada catches up to old Miss Birkin and that's when the dots start to get connected. Identify yourself. Ada, Ada Wong. Ada Wong. I've heard that name before. Now I remember. 
One of the men from Chicago who came to assist the T-Virus research used his girlfriend's name as his password. Ada and John, I believe. Oh, shit. And that informs Ada of John's death, which we already knew about, seeing as though we read his death letter in the first game. The two get into a tussle over a locket, which belongs to little Sherry, who dropped it earlier in the game, and Annette takes a mankind Hell in a Cell-esque bump over the balcony. Yeah! Inside that fancy locket, a little taste of the G. After they reunite, Ada tells Leon about John, and she doesn't seem to care that he's dead. Like, at all. Which is odd, seeing as though the whole reason she came here was to find him. Eventually, Ada gets slashed by William, and when Leon goes to find help, he bumps into Annette, who somehow took that balcony fall like a fucking champion. Annette blows Ada's whole game and spills the beans. Ada didn't come here looking for John. She never loved John to begin with. She's a spy working for a rival company to Umbrella and was sent here to get her hands on the G-Virus before Umbrella had the chance. Before any of this can really sink in, the tyrant shows up and shit gets real. Ada makes the save and seemingly kills the big son of a bitch, but she eats a choke slam through a generator for her troubles. She professes her love for Leon, and the two share a kiss as she drifts away. The self-destruct system kicks in, Leon reunites with Claire and Sherry to make their escape, but goodness fucking gracious, the tyrant is still alive. His leather jacket and gloves melted away in the molten steel, and what has emerged is something much, much deadlier. The battle ensues, the tyrant eats bullets even easier than before, and when all hope seems lost... Here. Was that... Ada? The finish sees an excellent callback to the original gameplay out, and the tyrant, once again, is blown to smithereens. Leon, Claire, and Sherry board the escape train and go home, right? Wrong again. The final, and I promise, final version of William shows up, and at this point, I mean, come on. This literally looks like a gigantic human asshole that had an unfortunate run-in with a porcupine. I mean, seriously! There's no way they didn't know that this thing looked like an evil butthole. The final showdown ends with the leakage and deflation of Butthole William. Leon unhooks the train cars and William dies in a fiery explosion as the underground lab self-destructs. After all this, all the monsters, all the betrayals, all the horrible deaths, the final cutscene leads us into the credits. And what a fucking doozy this last cutscene is. Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. <laughs> That right there is the story of Resident Evil 2. It's kind of crazy how far that story came from back in the 1.5 days. Noburo Shigamura's biggest complaint was that this one had almost no ties to the original, and he corrected that in a big, big way. Nobody back during RE1's development had any idea who John and Ada were, clearly, and Shugimura turned that tiny little detail into an overarching storyline here in the sequel. Not only did he kill the concept of Elsa Walker and turn her into Claire Redfield, the sister of one of RE1's stars, but he wrote into RE2's script where Chris had gone, opening a world of possibilities for future games to pick up that story and do with it as they please. Spoiler, Shugimura was already writing the story for what would become Code Veronica before RE2 even shipped. He was looking further into the distance than anyone even knew. He did the same thing with Jill and Barry, noting through diaries that the STARS team were still on the hunt for conclusive evidence with which they could bring down Umbrella for good. The world building in Resident Evil 2 is on some next level shit, but hey, that's what happens when you bring in a highly experienced, impressively credentialed television and film writer to take control of your script. You may still have some questions and that's fine, because we're gonna dig even deeper. One of the questions my friends and I always had was why the hell is this police department full of these beautiful statues and sculptures? Why do they move and unlock fucking funhouse puzzles that uncover hidden gems and secret keys? What the hell is going on here? 
Well, that's actually explained in the story, if you're paying attention, which, as children, obviously my friends and I were not. This isn't just some police station. The RPD precinct was actually an art museum at first. The building was repurposed and redecorated as a police department, but all the little ins and outs and wacky shit remained in the structure's DNA, as it were. That's some more Naboro Shugimura shit, by the way. Originally, there were absolutely no explanations for why this police department was full of smoke and mirrors puzzles. Thank God they hired him. Many of you may be wondering why I've not called the tyrant Mr. X throughout this video. Well, it's because it wasn't his real name. He's commonly referred to as Mr. X these days, but nowhere in the game is he referred to as such. He's really not referred to at all. He just shows up to bust your shit. But when you really think about it, none of us even knew he was a tyrant until after he fell into the molten steel and emerged without his disguise. His claws and exact mannerisms to the original game's boss was actually a huge reveal at the time. So where does the name Mr. X come from if he's never labeled in the story? The first place I remember seeing it was on the packaging for the Toy Biz line of Resident Evil 2 action figures. These figures were fucking awesome, by the way, and good lord has their value gone up over the years. Outside of the action figures, though, the official strategy guide also labeled the big man as Mr. X. So where did it come from? Honestly, I have no fucking idea where it originated. It seems like the name traces back to the merchandise, but who decided to put the name on the merchandise? And before you say, oh, Claire called him Mr. X in the novelization, that came out in 1999, a year after the game was released. Look, I've researched this to the ends of the earth and I'm finding nothing conclusive. If one of you has the answer, let me know. It would be criminal for me to cover the entirety of Resident Evil 2 and not mention Marvin, the wounded police officer the player encounters inside the RPD. He's a good man, a helpful man, and he went out a hero. He also turns right in front of our very eyes, which was absolutely horrific the first time we experienced it in 1998. Sorry Marvin, you're a memorable part of the game, but as a Zombo, you's gots to go. The original Resident Evil had a story mode, and that was it. You could replay it to your heart's content, you could try as hard as possible to get the best ranking and unlock weapons with infinite ammo and feel invincible, but outside of making little changes on your own, that's kind of where it began and ended. RE2 features a playable side mission called The Fourth Survivor, which is unlocked by completing any A and B scenario combination of your choice, as long as you earn at least an A ranking. We take control of Hunk, aka one of the boys in black we saw get decimated by William Birkin earlier in the story. The mission is to escape the RPD with a sample of the G-Virus, while every big and nasty monster you can imagine are roaming the halls and out for blood. And if you master Hunk and his mission, you can do it again as a giant block of tofu. I'm not kidding. All you have to do is beat both scenarios three times with A rankings, and you can play the Tofu Survivor as a chunk of fucking tofu. Why? Well, here's the story. The image of the giant cube was a placeholder used to test collision detecting with enemies in the environment. But why not cut this out when the game was completed? I think that's pretty obvious because it's funny. It's obvious that Resident Evil 2 accomplished everything a sequel is supposed to. It looks better. It plays better. It furthers the story in several directions, introduces new characters, so on and so forth. The reviews reflected the series' growth in spades. Sales-wise, it was a blockbuster. In Japan alone, the game sold through 1.4 million units in just four days, a feat that took the original title an entire year to accomplish. Resident Evil 2 took the franchise into the stratosphere and undoubtedly cemented the name of Resident Evil into the history books. Hideki Kamiya may not have started RE2 as a man with a vision, but in reflection, everything fell where it was supposed to. And it's worth noting that 15 years after its cancellation, a playable prototype demo of Resident Evil 1.5 leaked onto the internet. Modders around the world have built onto the demo, fixing broken walls and doors and attempting to complete the original vision, which speaks volumes to the passion of fans of the series. Hardcore fans of the original game, like myself, we were spoiled, man. Just six years after the release of the original game, we were treated to that mind-blowingly amazing remake on the Nintendo GameCube. 
Fans of RE2 couldn't wait for their turn in the sun. As the years rolled on, the wishes, requests, and demands for a reimagining on more powerful hardware piled up until they overflowed, leaving the diehards with hopes that the remake train would be pulling around any second now. Five years after the original launch, RE2 was re-released on the Nintendo GameCube, and it looked like this. It wasn't a remake. It was a straight port. Fans were heartbroken, critics weren't impressed, and as the years rolled on, the talks of a possible remake all but died out. That is until Sony's E3 2018 press conference, when not only were the hopes and dreams of Resident Evil 2 fans around the world finally realized, but they were exceeded. After over 20 years, the wait for a Resident Evil 2 remake was over. The title earned Game of the Year awards from countless media outlets and set the bar for what a remake can and should be higher than ever before. The legacy of Resident Evil 2 is unquestionable. Whether you grew up in the 90s like myself and played the original game, or were introduced to the series through the remake, it doesn't matter. We're all the same. We all know the layout of the RPD building like the back of our hand. We can talk along with Claire and Leon and mouth their lines as they deliver them, and we're all probably still a little scared of Mr. X, whether we want to admit it or not. Resident Evil 2 took the series to new heights and opened up this universe for a whole new world of direct sequels. And prequels. After Resident Evil and Resident Evil 2 both outperformed sales expectations, Capcom found the roots of the series firmly planted in the soil of popular culture. The merchandise was abundant, but the toys and comics were small potatoes as far as what was to come. Shortly after the release of the first game in 1996, the motion picture rights to the Resident Evil franchise were purchased by Constantine Films. Several scripts came and went before the first ever official Resident Evil movie actually released in 2002, but were not there yet. Castro, tell them to relax. Relax, we're only in 1999. 2002 is later in the series. Don't make me come back here and bust your ass! Thank you, Castro. You know what's funny is that although a theatrical film was indeed still several years out, we did get a taste of what could be through RE2's live-action TV commercial that aired exclusively in Japan, which was directed by film legend and Night of the Living Dead creator George A. Romero. Why this didn't air elsewhere, I don't know. The camp is on point. It's cheesy as all hell. And back in 1998, this would have sold me on the game. Big time. Biohazard 2. The reason I'm touching on Resident Evil crossing over into other avenues is to convey just how big the series was coming. And not only in the public, but behind closed doors as well. Immediately after the release of RE2, Capcom had begun development on four separate games under the Resident Evil umbrella. One of them was a practically non-canonical adventure following a brand new character through swaths of infected on the streets of Raccoon City. Another was what would eventually become Code Veronica, a title exclusive to the Sega Dreamcast. The script for what we would come to know as Resident Evil Zero was in its infancy. And last but not least, we have the project that was originally intended to be released as Resident Evil 3. The story was to unfold on a commercial cruise ship, where the player would take control of our boy Hunk, who was looking to secure a sample of the G-Virus for his employer, Umbrella. Very early into development on the proposed third game in the series, Sony announced the PlayStation 2, set for release in March of 2000 in Japan and October of 2000 in the US. Knowing that Resident Evil 3, which was planned for release on the original PlayStation, would not be complete until way after the PS2 already launched, Capcom threw their arms up and said, fuck it. The spin-off game, the one centered around a brand new face escaping the hellscape of Raccoon City, was much further along. The decision was made to replace the debuting character with RE1's Jill Valentine, slap a big 3 sticker on the cover art, and get this bastard on store shelves to make as many sales as possible before the PlayStation 2 showed up. The cruise liner concept starring Hunk was unceremoniously thrown in the trash, right next to Resident Evil 1.5. 
This all sounds like a recipe for disaster, doesn't it? Game cancellations, too many irons in the fire at the same time, completely abandoned concepts, rebranded sequels, good lord. And wait, this game is taking place in Raccoon City, with the star of Resident Evil 1 patrolling the streets. Didn't Resident Evil 2 just take place in Raccoon City? How the fuck did Claire and Leon not run into Jill? Resident Evil 3 takes place both before and after the events of RE2. Follow along with me here, it's a little crazy. Jill's attempts at escaping the nightmare that has enveloped Raccoon City begins just one day prior to Claire and Leon's arrival. Everything is fucked. The whole city is a war zone. You thought the little strip of the streets we saw in RE2 was bad? Good lord, the rest of the city is so much worse. In her attempts to flee, Jill comes across her star's compatriot Brad Vickers, who you may remember as the pilot from the original game. He's hysterical, completely drowning in fear. He rambles on about how someone is coming for them, someone who is specifically targeting STARS members, and that there's no hope to escape. Eventually, he clears his head and builds an evacuation helicopter, allowing himself and Jill to leave the town behind. Just kidding, he's gruesomely murdered right in front of Jill by what the fuck is that thing? This is Nemesis. Help! He's a new tyrant model created by Umbrella with one mission in mind. Do not let those big mouth stars operatives live to tell the tale of what they know about Umbrella's shady dealings. The Nemesis model is much more intelligent than previous incarnations, and can be sent into a battlefield with the ability to think on its feet, carry out orders, and even use firearms in its quest to achieve its goal. What the fuck is with its look though? Honestly. The original Tyrant was uglier than shit, his skin was gray, his organs were outside of his body, he was a mess. Mr. X, featured in Resident Evil 2, at least he had more of a human-like appearance. He's kinda just like a gray big show. But Nemesis? He's the fucking ugliest one yet! He looks like something that fell into your deep fryer and you don't know whether it's a chunk of onion you thought you threw away or a fucking piece of wood that fell off your kitchen cabinets when you weren't looking. I get the idea, the boss of a survival horror game needs to be scary and intimidating. If Nemesis looked like Idris Elba, players would be like, How you doing? Instead of running for their lives. But still, Logically, I would think Umbrella would want their killing machine to be somewhat understated so it could slip in, make the kill, and slip out. Like a ninja, or a hitman, or any other version of a contracted killer you prefer to slide in here. Not a 7 foot, leather clad, charbroiled, centibite looking prick with a rocket launcher the size of a jeep transmission hooked to his forearm. But hey, that's just me talking. While Resident Evil 3 may look nearly identical to its two older brothers on the surface, there are several brand new mechanics added to the gameplay to spice things up. For starters, we can now find different types of gunpowder, which can be combined in myriad ways in order to create whatever sort of ammo we desire. While RE3 is still definitely scary, it carries less of a horror movie vibe and more of an action movie attitude throughout the campaign. With that in mind, the developers made sure the player isn't as heavy and helpless as we've grown accustomed to. A brand new quick turn feature as well as a dodge mechanic have been added to even the playing field against the enemy, which comes in handy all the time. And hey, what screams action movie attitude more than big red explosive barrels, huh? Couple all these gameplay updates in with the fact that nearly a dozen times throughout the campaign, the screen goes negative and we're tasked with making a split second decision in the face of life or death. These decisions stack and can alter the way the story unfolds in a big, big way, but we're not there yet, so no spoilers. Like I said, Resident Evil 3 may appear identical at a glance, but this is not some lame ass copy and paste job, that's for sure. On her way through the raging fires that are overtaking the city, Jill meets Carlos, Nikolai, and Mikhail, the surviving members of a group of mercenaries hired by Umbrella to rescue civilians from the war zone. With the city falling further and further into chaos with each passing minute, their plan is to ride a cable car to the middle of town, ascend the clock tower, and call in their rescue chopper. Sounds easy, right? Well, it's not. We discover several bodies of our newfound friends, fallen comrades during our adventure. 
At one point, Jill seemingly walks in on Nikolai shooting and killing one of his own men, whom Nikolai claims was on the verge of turning, and he was simply putting him out of his misery. Hmm, I don't know about that. Nemesis is constantly showing up and ruining the night. And let me tell you something, Dan Dans, Nemesis is no joke. Everywhere you thought you were safe, you're not. Nemesis doesn't give a fuck about your safety. He will chase you from one room to another. He will open doors. He's not some lumbering zombie dragging his foot like Homer Simpson to justify a handicap spot. This Kentucky Fried motherfucker sprints down the streets like Michael Sarah in Superbad, and he will get his hands on you. You can blow up the room he's in, he'll come back. You can eventually outrun him, he will find you. Go ahead, jump out the window, he's not far behind. Hideki Kamiya has stated that Nemesis was inspired by the T-1000, the liquid metal bad guy from Terminator 2. The same way John and Sarah Connor never felt safe and always felt like they were being watched is exactly how Kamiya wanted you to feel about Nemesis. Hearing that terrible music kick in as soon as you enter a room is horrifying. As more often than not, Nemesis is off screen. We're not sure where he is, but he knows exactly where we are. I hate it. I mean, I love it, but I hate it. Once the cable car is fixed up and ready to ride, Jill and Carlos, along with the injured Mikhail, set off for the clock tower. Nikolai disappeared when a gang of zombies rushed a building we were in. He's probably dead. Whatever. Fuck him. He's sketchy anyway. No more than three seconds after the cable car starts moving, Nemesis shows up. I'm sensing a pattern here. If you're in a Resident Evil game and you're depending on some sort of vehicle to provide transportation, there's a 94.7% chance that that vehicle is going to be infiltrated by a boss character. It's just the way it is. Mikhail makes the call to send you into the front of the car. He suckers Nemesis in, and once they're in clinch range, he pulls the pin on his final grenade, sacrificing himself for the good of the mission. The only problem with that strategy is that Nemesis survives the blast, and the cable car is fucked up beyond repair. Jill and Carlos are forced to jump out of the damn thing while it's still moving, but hey, we land basically on the doorstep of the clock tower anyway, so it's not that bad. The clock tower itself has a very RE1-esque mansion feel to it. Ornate staircases, libraries, tarantulas the size of a fucking Volkswagen, it's all in a day's work. Ringing the bell should be simple, but it's not, because this is Resident Evil. Ringing the bell requires us to find a necklace, a key, combine them into a super key necklace thing, retrieve three different gemstone balls from the hands of some old ass statues, drop the gemstone balls into the trays of these ancient paintings with clocks attached to them, which will eventually unlock these gold and silver gears, which we need to stack and insert into a machine inside the tower. It's so ridiculous. And you know, up until this point, the obstacles in our path have been way more reasonable and realistic than they were in previous games. So far it's been like, hey, I need this fire hose, but it's bolted down, I better go find a wrench. Hey, this shutter's locked, I need to open it up, I gotta find the right shaped crank. But as soon as we step foot in an old school piece of Raccoon City architecture, it becomes this whole elaborate plan of 15 steps with 20 questions just to ring a goddamn bell. I would say it's stupid, but it's all part of the Resident Evil charm. The bell is rung and it's finally over, right Jill? Huh? No. No. After Nemesis blows the rescue chopper sky high, we're doing battle in the garden, but this time Jill doesn't get away so easily. Nemesis actually infects Jill with the virus, which is the first time one of our playable characters has actually been infected. Jill fends the monster off, but after that, it's lights out. Carlos leads Jill to safety, and now the player steps into the shoes of Carlos Oliveira himself in search of something that can help Jill fend off the virus. Carlos's journey isn't an easy one, as every enemy that has stood in Jill's way is also waiting to pounce on him. And hey, this might be a good time to talk about some of these new monstrosities that have joined the party in the third game. What do you think? First up is the Drain Demos, which is a strange name, but hey, it's a strange enemy. Word on the street is that these vile sons of bitches are the product of fleas being exposed to the virus and mutating into something that closely resembled my good friend Giuseppe's worst nightmares. The Drain Demos cousin is called the Brain Sucker. Can you guess why? These guys... This is not my kind of guy. 
The Gravedigger is a subterranean worm that you don't want to mess with. The sliding worms can be considered the baby brothers of the Gravedigger, and they're also no joke. They'll suck you dry like a... Never mind. The Hunters are back, but this time are referred to as Hunter Betas, as these are not nearly as far along as the monsters we encountered in the mansion of the first game. These guys are imperfect creations, they're disfigured, and they're pissed about it. The Hunter Gamma, on the other hand, are something else entirely. These guys were designed by Umbrella for underwater attacks, and it shows. They may not be as instantaneously deadly as the original model, but the Gamma Boys will still finish you with the quickness if you're not careful. When my friends and I were younger, we hated the design of the Hunter Gamma. We thought this thing looked borderline friendly. In retrospect, I take that back entirely. I don't know if there's anything scarier than the idea of one of these frogman looking pricks dragging me off a dock and drowning me before swallowing my body whole. I don't think so. Send one of the original hunters my way. He'll cut my head off and it'll go way faster. No thanks to the Gamma Boys. Three days have gone by since Jill was infected, to be clear, so now Resident Evil 2 has officially happened. Okay, good. Now we've gone from prequel to sequel. Carlos travels to the hospital in search of some sort of help for Jill, and I must say, this is one of the most gruesome settings in series history up to this point. The dead bodies of the hospital staff are strewn about everywhere inside the building. A diary found in the lobby states that the patients who turned overran the doctors and killed everyone inside. This is horrible. Before long, we run into Nikolai, who's apparently still alive, and he just killed another one of his fucking men. What is this guy's deal? Nikolai turns the gun on Carlos, but our teammate who we thought had been killed pulls the pin on his final grenade, sacrificing himself for the... Wait a minute, what is with these guys going, fuck it, grenade me, when they get injured? Is this in the mercenary handbook? The deeper we go into the depths of the hospital, the clearer it becomes that this was no ordinary medical facility. There were tests on different monsters being conducted behind closed doors. Umbrella truly had their hand in everyone's pockets in this entire city, didn't they? The great thing about Umbrella being involved in this hospital, though, is that they left behind the formula for the T-Virus vaccine. Carlos secures the antidote and, hey, is that C4? Fighting his way back to Jill in time won't be easy, especially seeing as though Nemesis has returned once again, and this time he's transformed. His gear is deteriorating from all the damage, and his exposed upper body reveals several pulsating tentacles. Tentacles which he likes to use as a whip, a choking device, and a sternum puncturing spear. After incapacitating the beast, Carlos is able to inject Jill with the vaccine. The escape plan is back on, but hey, check this out. It's a written order to the supervisors. I'm one of the supervisors. The order is to destroy the hospital, all evidence, and the formula for the cure to the T-Virus. Gotcha. While Carlos and the boys were indeed hired by Umbrella to save civilians, the supervisors were all tasked with killing their underlings and taking notes on the situation. Of course, why wouldn't they be? Hold on. Is it just me, or does Umbrella Corporation suck? Umbrella sucks, thank you Sean Phoenix. A supervisor's report can also be uncovered, which details the thoughts of one of the men in charge. His notes reveal that the mission is to monitor the monsters. Nemesis, the hunters, everything. Umbrella wants first-hand, eyewitness accounts of what these things can actually do in battle. Lovely. He even mulls over the idea of purposely infecting POWs with the virus before releasing them back to their home bases, knowing full well that they'd turn and infect the rest of the opposition. Good god, man. This just gets darker and darker. And if that isn't enough for you, how about the manager's diary, which reveals that a small outbreak in Raccoon City was actually all a part of the plan. These pieces of shit even developed a gas that would rapidly decompose the bodies of their infected specimens in order to destroy any and all evidence of their experiments. This part actually works in Jill's favor, as the 27th encounter with Nemesis actually takes place in the disposal room, and guess who accidentally slashes a gas line full of the decomposition materials? Bye bye, bitch. The trash is taken out, and that's that, right? Of course not! Nikolai opens fire on the facility from inside a goddamn attack helicopter. Now, if it were you, would you attempt to negotiate with the Mad Russian? Or would you blow his ass to pieces with a rocket launcher? Yeah, 
That's what I thought. It's at this point that everything finally seems to be coming up Millhouse, but nothing could be further from the truth. Umbrella's little experiment has officially failed and the word has gotten out. The United States government as a whole has been made aware of this horrific outbreak and the president himself has signed off on a missile strike capable of wiping out the entire town in order to contain the virus. Think about what we've been going through in real life with the coronavirus here in 2020 and let that thought go through your head again. It's fucking scary. The final showdown takes place between Jill and the somehow still alive nemesis. This guy just doesn't go away. Why won't you die? Luckily for Jill, there's a big prototype railgun in the room which can be used to explode the nemesis shithead once and for all. System overheating. With the missile nearly to its destination, Carlos and Jill are saved by a mystery man in a helicopter, who turns out to be none other than Barry Burton. As our trio escape the terrors of the night, the missile strikes and Raccoon City is completely obliterated, wiping the T-Virus off the face of the Earth. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis fully delivers on its action movie formula, man. It's a great time, it's a wild ride, it's nuts. And even though we've gone through the whole story, there are still some excellent little moments that I want to touch on. For starters, the diaries and journals left behind do not disappoint. These add context to the world in every game in the Resident Evil franchise, and Nemesis is no different. I especially appreciate the journalist diary found in the Raccoon City press building. We touched on how no one was talking about the outbreak in Resident Evil 2 because Umbrella was in everyone's pockets, but you can't buy the free press. This guy was following the case and was ready to blow the lid off the entire situation when he lost contact with the outside world and the entire building was overrun with the undead. Poor bastard. He was one of the last good souls left in town and he was torn to shreds like all the rest. Remember earlier when I mentioned how the decisions we make can alter the course of the story? Well, that wasn't a lie. We can blow Nikolai's helicopter out of the sky, or we can attempt to talk to him. Going the negotiation route leads to Nikolai revealing that he has taken Umbrella's offer and intends to cash in on the price on Jill's head. If you never attempt to speak with him, it's never made clear that Umbrella has indeed placed a hit on Jill, which is an interesting little wrinkle. Another thing that had our childhood head spinning was during the final encounter with Nemesis in the railgun room, the corpse of a fallen T-103 super tyrant in final form can be seen crashed through a wall. What the hell happened here? Who battled this thing? And more importantly, who finished him off? If you look really, really closely throughout the final areas, the corpses of several T-103 tyrants can be found strewn about the wreckage. That helicopter in Resident Evil 2 was indeed carrying six T-103 tyrant pods after all, and it looks like they may have dropped them all. The mystery here is so intriguing, and to my knowledge, has never been deeply explained inside the canon of the series. I stress, inside the canon of the series. My brother, my friend Tim, and I would stay up way too late during sleepovers talking about this scene for hours, explaining what we thought went down and how it occurred. We'd debate who would win in a fight between William, the Tyrant, and Nemesis. Those were the days, man. I have been super positive up to this point because both of these games are very near and dear to my heart, but I would never forgive myself if I didn't touch on this real quick. The reveal of Barry Burton at the end of Resident Evil 3 could not possibly have been handled any worse. First of all, he's not wearing the outfit we're used to seeing him in. That's forgivable though, people don't wear the same clothes every day. Jill's not wearing the same clothes she did from the first game. But they changed his voice actor too. But just take a look at this! Are you ready to finish this? Next up, he's wearing a hat and sunglasses so we can barely see his face and on top of it all, his hair is a completely different color. Is this even fucking Barry Burton? Who the fuck is this guy? 
If it is Barry, which, I mean, it is, why did they go about his cameo in such bizarre fashion? That's like if the history of Resident Evil Part 3 opened like this and I just carried on as if nothing happened. What the hell were they thinking? Much like Resident Evil 2's The Fourth Survivor, RE3 also features an unlockable mode called The Mercenaries Operation Mad Jackal. Take control of the Merc of your choice and get from point A to point B inside the time limit. Earning time extensions along the way is of key importance, so making sure your goals are met is paramount in terms of a successful run. As you may have guessed, yes, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis released to rave reviews and outstanding commercial success. While the third installment didn't quite reach the heights of the original or Resident Evil 2, it still did extraordinarily well, moving more than 3 million units at retail. Without going through the same dog and pony show, yes, RE3 was ported straight onto the Nintendo GameCube, and no, players were not happy that it wasn't a remake. Fans of the series were happy, however, in April of 2020 when Resident Evil 3's actual remake released on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Once again, seeing one of our childhood favorites from more than two decades ago reimagined on more powerful hardware is truly remarkable. No matter how many times Capcom dangles that remake carrot, we are all going to keep asking for more. Plus, can we take a second and talk about how hot Jill is in the remake? My word. Resident Evil 2 and 3 are many things. They're an exercise in expansion, opening a singular story and unfolding the possibilities into new avenues and crossroads. They're a demonstration of patience and restraint, as their development cycles were deeply troubled and nearly ruined before cooler heads prevailed, resulting in a stellar final product. Resident Evil 2 and 3 were proof that the undead outbreak and virus-laden underbelly of Mega Corporation Umbrella was not lightning caught in a bottle, and that this franchise had many, many more stories to come. But with Raccoon City vaporized and the TNG viruses eradicated, what would be next for our star's members on their quest to take down Umbrella once and for all? Dan Dance, thank you for joining me for this, The History of Resident Evil Part 2 Undead Evolution. Next time out, it's the history of Resident Evil Part 3, The Root of All Evil, where we're going to do our damnedest to dig deeper and deeper to try and find out what the hell is actually going on here. If you like the series, consider heading over to ProWrestlingTees.com slash 616 Entertainment and picking up a shirt. Or you can head over to Patreon.com slash 616 Entertainment sign up at any level you desire. There's all kinds of different bonus perks for you there. I love you guys, and I will see you next time. Let's not waste any time and jump right into it.
Damn, that was one take, brother. How about it? Two that we all know and love. Shall we? I'm fucking... I am nailing this. Do you understand? We're way too intense. The broken glass. The fucking... The world building in Resident Evil 2 is on some next level shit. But hey, that's what happens when you bring in a fucking... <laughs> highly experienced, impressively credentialed. But nothing could be further from the truth. At this point, fuck. The United States government has been a maid. If you like this series, consider heading over to patreon.com slash 616 entertainment and show it support. The infinite ammo to feel invincible, but outside of that, it was. You fucking motherfucker. What does that say? I don't know. And set up this universe for a whole new fuck!